one of the first things about electric circuits is you have to have a circuit. By having a circuit, that means that you have a pathway that starts and ends the same place. So if it doesn't start and end the same place, you don't have a circuit, you aren't doing electric circuits. You can still have some electrical things, of course, but not electric circuits. So change from Panasonic to the picture. Here's our simplest electric circuit, the one on the right. This is your simplest electric circuit. We have symbols for the things we put in circuits because we don't like to write out big words or try to draw accurate pictures. So let's just describe each one of these symbols to make sure you know what they are. The symbol here, that's the symbol for a voltaic cell. Um, these are chemical cells that produce a fixed voltage if everything's working right. As you start to use them, the voltage will drop while you're using it. So you see it's two parallel lines, one longer than the other. The longer line is always the positive. So while this picture has a plus sign, that plus sign is unnecessary because you can read the longer line is the positive side for the cell. So that's a voltaic cell. And this here is the symbol for a resistor. So the resistor has straight lines with sharp angles. So those are our two most basic circuit elements. Now there's one more thing that goes in circuits that we've already learned about, and that's the capacitor. So the capacitor has a symbol that looks like this. How can you differentiate between the capacitor and the voltaic cell? Right, the capacitor, they're equal length, the voltaic cell, the positive is longer, the negative is shorter. Now there's another one that we really need to know, especially because of how Eddie Murphy has negatively affected my pronunciation of things. This symbol here is the symbol for a battery. A battery is a battery of cells. What is a battery? That's more than one put together. And so you can see the symbol for a battery is the way I drew it, two cells smashed together. Sometimes you'll see it with three cells. I've never seen any other variation. Sometimes people will draw the symbol for a cell and call it a battery. So they'll say, I have a nine volt battery. Hot tip, you don't have nine volt, or you don't have nine volt cells. They're always batteries. And then they'll show the nine volt battery like this People just aren't precise. It's just like me saying velocity and speed at the wrong times. So the technical symbol for a battery is two cells together. We also will be using in the, these, this week and next week some meters. The meters will put like a circle with an A in it, not for anarchy, but for an ammeter and a circle with a V in it we'll use for a voltmeter. So those are our basic elements we have, the symbols we have, the voltaic cell, the resistor, the battery are the ones that I really want to make sure you understand for today. Just symbols, and then we'll talk about what they, well, yeah, we'll talk about what they mean a little more carefully. Electric current is a new, technically a new word for today. Current we all have a certain understanding of current. We have some IRR majors. They have to go take a summer class where they're doing like white water rescue. How many people have already taken that? Okay, excellent. So I am sure you talked about the current in a river. And what does that mean? Okay, the flow. The current is measuring how much is flowing in the stream, it's how much water is flowing. So if you have a high current in the stream, that means you have a lot of water flow. With electricity, the current is virtually the same thing. The current is measuring the rate at which charge is flowing through the circuit. Now, if you have a conductor 
what kind of charged particles are moving in the conductor? Negative, they're electrons. And so when you have a current flowing in a wire, it's electrons traveling through the wire. On the other hand, when you have a current in something like um, a fluid, like battery acid, that current could be both positive and negative charges moving. The definition of current is really quite basic. Current is the rate, well, put it in the wrong place. It's the rate of flow of charge. The rate of flow means how fast is it flowing? So we define current, there's the symbol for current, I. And I is defined as change in charge over change in time. There should not be a dot in the middle of the triangle, that was an artifact. And what the change in charge means is how much charge flow went past this point per second. Now, if you want to be really technical, current doesn't have a direction, and yet it does, right? Because you have current is flowing charge, and that charge has a direction. It's moving. And so we define the direction for our current, not a vector, but it has a direction, right? That's basically the way it is in physics for current. We define the direction for the current as the direction of positive charge flow. But in a wire, it's electrons that are traveling. So in this picture, if we had positive charge flowing to the right, then we would have current flowing to the right. But what's really happening is you have electrons that are flowing this way. So in a wire, electrons are flowing the opposite direction from the current. This leads some people to really get up tight. When I was teaching at PUC, I taught the electronics class for science majors, and another guy taught the electronics class for technology majors. Um, and he was very adamant that you should talk about electron current because in a wire, which is all he knew about basically, he did you know, professional electrical work, and it's always electrons flowing a wire, the electrons are flowing one direction, and he said that should be the direction we measure the current. Whereas physicists take a different point of view, we say, we define current by this equation, not by the motion of any actual object. And so the direction of positive charge flow is positive direction. If it's negative charge, well, that just flips the direction. So if negative charge flows this way, it's the same as positive going that way, and we define the current as the way positive would go. If you look at the unit, the unit of current, what's the unit for charge? So charge is coulombs, and of course time is seconds. So the unit for current is coulombs per second. And we define one ampere is equal to one coulomb per second. So the amp here, more commonly we just call it the amp, is the unit for current. Now something that's really kind of startling, at least it was to me, you know the very beginning of first semester we talked about fundamental units. We have the meter, which is fundamental. We have the kilogram, which is fundamental. We have the second, which is fundamental. All of the other units in first semester, except for temperature, were derived from those fundamental units. They were all derived units. Now we get to electricity, and you would tend to think that the Coulomb would be the fundamental unit of electric, electricity. But because of ease of reproducing a measurement, the ampere is actually the fundamental unit for electricity, and the Coulomb is a derived unit based on an ampere. So just a little tidbit, kind of startling, because 
you know, coulombs per second doesn't seem like that should be the derived unit, but the, the derived unit is one coulomb is equal to an ampere second. So here is the way a simple circuit works. The battery is a power supply. Remember, voltage is potential energy per charge. The battery is giving electrons potential energy. And by giving them energy, it's the same as if you were to take a ball and raise it. You gave it potential energy by raising it. You let go and the ball will do whatever path it goes on determines, but you gave it the energy by raising it. That's what a battery is doing. So you have charge, and we will talk about a fictitious positive charge here because that's how we talk about things in physics. If I have a fictitious positive charge coming out of the positive side of my battery, it comes to this resistor, and the resistor does exactly what it name, its name sounds like. It resists electrons flowing through it. By resisting, it means it's going to require energy to push them through. So that resistor is going to take away energy as the electrons go through it. So the name resistor is a very useful name because it tells you what it does. I've already talked about everything on that slide. Um, this one here is... We're not going to go into the details of current versus the charge carrier, but I do want to talk about what's actually going on in the wire when current is flowing. We have a wire, let's say it's a copper wire. That copper has lots of electrons that are conduction electrons, electrons that can move relatively easily. And if you put that wire in an electric field, then there's going to be a net force on the electrons to make them start to move. What do you think the electrons are doing if I don't put the wire in an electric field? It's a what do you think? You can be wrong. Just what do you think? Nothing. Okay. She says nothing. Just sitting there stationary. It turns out that the electrons are pretty much the same as molecules in the air. I have still air here. Are the molecules in the still air stationary? No. They're traveling around really quickly. They're going, you know, 100 meters per second or faster just in the still air. The same thing's going to be going on in that wire. The electrons are just going to be bouncing all over the place in there moving quite rapidly. If I put it in an electric field, then there'll be a net force that makes them start to drift. And so we talk about the drift velocity, how fast the electrons are drifting, right? They're moving around in random directions, right? Each time they hit something and bounce off, they change direction. But if you put in the electric field, they have a, a general drift. And now comes the really surprising thing. If I turn off the light switch, well, I've got to be careful which one I do. Okay, see, that was slow reacting here. Let's turn off. If I turn off the light switch, how long is it from when I flip the switch to when the light goes off? Pretty much instantaneous. It's not exactly instantaneous, but it's pretty quick. The electrical signal is actually traveling at somewhere around two-thirds of the speed of light. So the delay that you notice is actually the delay in the light bulbs, not the delay in the electrical signal. But the speed for the drift of an electron, if I look at an electron, I say, in one second, how far will that electron have drifted down the wire? It's only on the order of a centimeter or a few centimeters. So the electrons themselves are moving at a very pedestrian pace down the wire but the electrical signal is traveling at two-thirds the speed of light. Does it seem contradictory to say that? No. To, to me, at first, it did seem contradictory. And so a good analogy to understand that 
is to talk about chain reactions. You're going down the freeway and somebody hits the brakes. The person behind you hits the brakes, the person behind them hits the brakes. You have a chain reaction and the speed at which the brake lights light up is much faster than the speed at which the cars are actually traveling if you're in LA traffic where you're traveling 15 miles an hour. Right, so the speed for the signal to travel is the speed of the chain reaction. One electron causes another one, causes another one, and so on. And so the electrons, I don't turn on the switch, and the effect occurs when the electrons get to that location. It's the chain react that stops, boom, the whole situation stops. Now to Ohm's law. Georg Ohm. Notice that with a lot of materials, there was a simple relationship between voltage and current. Not all materials, mind you, only certain ones. These materials we call ohmic materials because they obey Ohm's law. So in these materials, he noticed that there is that linear relationship, and I always have to point this out. When I was in graduate school, I had a friend who had been in the military, and he was an electrician in the military. And so we were talking about doing electrical work. And he said, yeah, you know, in the military, they taught us, if you learn Ohm's three laws, you can do anything in electronics. I was like, Ohm's three laws? Yeah, Ohm's first law. V equals IR. Okay, that is Ohm's law. And then it says, and then there's Ohm's second law. I equals V over R. And then there's Ohm's third law. R is equal to V over I. And I was like, wow, they really do take the cream of the crop to be electricians in the military. Of course, why did I mock? I didn't mock him, okay. But why do I mock the procedure? They're all the same equation. Now, if you go and get your ham radio license, I think you deal with the same level of, of the equations. But um, so that's a very important equation for a lot of materials. V equals IR. V is the voltage difference across the resistor. So I have this resistor here. V is going to be the voltage difference between the positive and negative sides of the resistor. I is the current going through. So V is the voltage difference I is the current through. So the current is traveling through the resistor. We show the current with this arrow, and the current keeps going in a loop. The current doesn't stop. It doesn't start. It doesn't get absorbed or created. The current is going continuously. The battery is causing the current to flow but the current is continuing to flow. Now you can have the current split and come together, but as long as you have something causing current to flow, you're not gonna have the current flow and then here's where it ends. Or you're not gonna have, here there's no current and here the current begins. It flows around the circuit. If the circuit's broken, then you can't have the current flow because it needs to continue. Then there's R. R is the resistance. That's just something that's telling us about how much energy per charge is taken out. So if we take this equation, R is V over I, what were the units of volts? Where are the units of a volt? joules per coulomb and then the unit of current what was the unit of current we just mentioned 
Okay, coulombs per second. You could have also said amps. And so that means that the unit of resistance, units of resistance are joules times seconds divided by coulomb squared or joules per coulomb ampere. You will never, ever see those two written out because physicists tend to be, call it efficient, call it lazy. We just define a new unit. The ohm. The omega symbol is for ohm. The ohm is the unit of resistance. So yes, that ohm can be made up of base units. You can convert, you know, joules into kilogram meters per second. Or joules are kilogram meters squared per second squared. Um, coulombs, of course, you convert it into amperes to get into base units. You can convert it all into base units, but that's the unit we use for resistance, the ohm. So Ohm's law, named after Georg Ohm, the unit of resistance, named after Georg Ohm. Measuring the voltage. We're going to be measuring the voltage today. Now, how you measure the voltage is a little bit up to you. I have these things here that will measure both current and voltage. But it turns out our power supplies will also measure current and voltage. My recollection is the power supply didn't make me happy in its measuring. And so I went to something else to measure. My recollection is not strong enough to remember exactly what we did. I'm pretty sure we just used these things. So this here has the wires coming out that measure voltage. Now voltage is the difference. It's the difference between the positive side and the negative side. So if you look on the meter here, it says red is positive. That means on your circuit, you should have marked which side is the positive side of the resistor, and you put the red on the side that you have marked as positive. The black is labeled as negative, so you put the black on the side that's labeled negative. So these are going across the resistor, and they measure the voltage across the resistor. So that's how we measure the voltage. Now, current is a little more complicated. I don't think I have one for current, so I'm just going to stay with this. To measure the current, you're measuring how much is going through. So if I want to measure the current, I'm going to have to break my circuit and put the meter in the circuit. So I will say, here's the thing I want to find the current through. So I have to break the circuit here. So I'm just going to break it right here and put my ammeter right there. Now, if you look at the ammeter, the ammeter on this doesn't have wires. It just has circles that says current and has a plus and a minus. Well, with that ammeter, to use this, I'm going to have to grab two wires. When we moved over to this building, I lost the vast majority of my wires. I have no idea where they went to, but somehow they did not make the move with me. Yes, makes me sad. So I put wires in here. Oh, shoot. Yeah, that, that wasn't good for it at all. That damaged the tip. I didn't have to buy any tip. Okay. To measure the current, I need to break the circuit and put this in the circuit. So let me take this one out of here. I'm going to put this in here. So here's my voltage coming out. And I have my circuit set up so it's going through my resistor. Now to measure the voltage, I'm just going to take these volt leads and put the red to red black to black, and that's measuring the voltage across my resistor. To measure the current, though, 
I actually need to break the circuit and I need to make it go from the positive into the current. So I'm going to take these two wires out that I just put in because I wasn't thinking. That's the way I roll. And I'm going to take this out and put it in the positive. And then I'm going to connect from the negative to where it was. So I just broke the circuit and remade the circuit with now it has to go through my meter and then it continues on. Now you notice this moved my voltage sensor as well. My voltage sensor is now not just across the resistor, it's across the resistor and the ammeter. We call something that measures current ammeter. Am is the two first two letters of amp. So it's going across my ammeter. Is that right or wrong? Okay, I heard right and wrong. Well, let's see. If I take my voltmeter off and put it over here, now my voltmeter is just measuring it across the resistor again. But now my ammeter is also measuring the current that's going through my voltmeter. So it turns out there is no perfect way to measure both the current and the voltage at the same time. They're going to give you the same measurement either way because we make the ammeter so it has an extremely low resistance. Remember that equation V equals IR. If R is approximately zero, then IR is approximately zero and there's no voltage drop across the ammeter. We make the voltage meter so it has an enormously large resistance. So if it has an enormously large resistance, then to have some voltage V, the current, I is V over R, is going to be approximately zero. So the ammeter causes virtually no effect on the current, or on the ammeter causes virtually no voltage drop. The current meter, not current meter, the voltage meter causes essentially no um, current drop. What's that? Hope it still writes. <laughs> Otherwise, we're going to have a, a non-writing rest of the class. Yeah, it still writes. Just Okay, I'm telling you all of this because when we get to the lab, you're going to have to do some of this stuff. How is the resistance in an actual material determined? That resistance depends on the material. Different materials have a different resistivity different resistance times blank is actually the unit and then you have to say okay well how far is it going to be going through the material if it's going longer through the material it's going to have more resistance if it has a shorter path it has to travel it will have a smaller resistance and then we have how how big is the wire how big is the cross section if cross section is big think of it like water through a pipe if you have a pipe that has a really big diameter, there's very little restriction on water flowing through. But as you make it smaller and smaller, there's more and more resistance to the flow. It's the same thing for wires. And of course, if you have a long pipe, there's going to be more resistance than if you have a short pipe. So the resistance for some actual material is the resistivity rho times the length of your resistor divided by the area. The row is material dependent, so different materials have different rows. That's the resistivity. Also, the resistivity varies with temperature. I'm not going to go into the temperature variation. It's pretty simple, but it's just not something we need to worry about. In a light bulb, it does make a difference. The resistance when it's cold is not the resistance when it's hot. Superconductors are special materials. Superconductors are materials that have a resistivity that's very, very close to zero. The resistivity of a normal material, if I remember right, a normal conductor, 
is something like 10 to the minus 9. I didn't look it up. In, in units of ohm times meters. The resistivity of a superconductor is one billionth of that. So the resistance of having charge go through a superconductor is like one billionth the resistance it would be in a wire. Well, wires have pretty low resistance. So superconductors have virtually no resistance. Superconductors are a great thing if we want to have efficient energy transfer because they would allow us to transfer electricity through wires without losing energy. And that's why we do lots and lots of research to try to find materials that allow us to have superconducting at room temperature. That's like the holy grail in superconductivity, finding something that will be superconducting at room temperature. Up here, there's a graph for HG, that's mercury. And you see the mercury has superconducting properties up to about 4.2 kelvins. 4.2 kelvins, very, very cold, right? Below 4.2 kelvins, it's superconducting. Above 4.2 kelvins, it starts to have a resistance that increases as the temperature increases. And you see there's a big shift there that occurs. Now, some materials have a, they call it the TC, the critical temperature, have a temperature critical that's around, I think, uh, was it 90 kelvins? 90 kelvins, is that warm or cold? Still very cold, but it's warmer than liquid nitrogen temperatures. And so you can put these materials in liquid nitrogen and it'll be superconducting at that temperature which makes them at least useful. They're, you know, mercury as a superconductor is not very useful because you've got to cool it down to liquid helium temperatures. So liquid helium, no, I don't, I think you have to go below liquid helium. I think liquid helium is about four. The, the critical temperature for helium to be super fluid is four degrees. Um, so you have to really cool mercury to make it have superconducting ability Whereas the, like, um, one, two, three, let's see, barium, copper, oxide, um, ceramic superconductors have critical temperatures that are in the ballpark of 90 Kelvin. Still not room temperature, but that's considered a, a high temperature superconductor. So just the reason we look for them. A quick definition, AC versus DC. AC stands for alternating current, DC for direct current. Direct current means it's always positive or always negative. The charge is always flowing the same direction. Whereas AC alternating, sometimes the charge is flowing one direction, sometimes it's flowing the other. What's going on in our circuits here, the lights here, is actually AC. That is, we have electrons going back and forth through the wires. So the electrons don't drift very far at all. Right, they, if they're drifting at, let's say, one centimeter per second, and we have alternating current with a frequency of 60 hertz, as it's going back and forth 60 times a second, that charge is moving a very minute distance. It's hardly drifting at all, just going back and forth. But you still have the chain reaction transferring energy, and so we're still getting energy out because of that chain reaction. Now, you can have lots of other waveforms besides sinusoidal and, and constant. But for general physics, that's all we will consider. DC will be constant and AC will be sinusoidal. Almost to the end of the, the lecture part here. A battery. How is a battery made? Of course, there are different kinds of batteries. There's the lithium ion batteries that you have in your smartphone. There's the nickel cadmium batteries that you probably have in your um, calculator. There's the lead acid battery that you probably have in your automobile. We'll just talk about the lead acid battery because you know what? It's the one that I kind of understand. It's the simple, simple one. The lead acid battery has a 
cathode and anode, as you can see looking at the left picture, the anode is just lead. And the cathode is lead oxide. So basically, there's a lot of lead in your car battery. That's why those things are heavy. And then you have those pieces of metal in an acid bath, sulfuric acid. Doesn't seem like it's all that important. I changed my battery. My battery's in bad shape. Splashed some battery acid on my pants. And if you see me wear those cargo pants, I got holes in the pants now from the battery acid on the pants. Just little spots where it splashed on me. So you have that battery acid. What's going on to make this anything that's kind of useful? And what's going on is redox reactions occurring at the anode and the cathode. So I have descriptions. I didn't make this. I think I took this from um, hyperphysics. You have a reaction at the cathode that is going to require electrons and the actual reactions are shown here. So at the cathode, you have the lead oxide and a sulfuric at, well, it's missing the H, right? The um, HSO4 minus and some hydrogens plus an electron all react to make lead sulfate and water. So you are sucking up one electron for every lead oxide that is turned into a lead sulfate. So electrons are being gobbled up, which means that it has less free electrons on the um, cathode, giving it a positive charge. On the anode, you have the lead also reacts with the HSO4, but in this case, it's producing, oh look, the same thing, lead sulfate and freeing up two electrons. The hydrogen stays aqueous, so these, these stay aqueous, but you have that charge that is being electrons delivered to the anode. So the anode has extra electrons on So this chemical reaction makes it so one side has a positive charge, one side has a negative charge. And there's an energy difference between those two. If you connect a wire between them, of course, the side with the excess electrons is going to ship those electrons over to the side that's missing electrons. And you're going to have an energy, potential energy difference that is equal to the voltage times the charge. So that's what's going on with the battery. Now, of course, this battery is relying on this chemical reaction. If you're not using it, what's going to happen to the chemical reaction? Okay, it doesn't run out of, it just reaches the point where it reaches equilibrium and the reaction stops. That is, you, you have the reaction, it produces this much charge, but if you have a more positive charge on the cathode, it's going to slow down the reaction rate. And so if you're not using the battery, the reaction just stops. When you use the battery, the reaction starts up again. Now, if you use the battery and you're using it heavily, the reaction is going to have to go faster to keep the voltage difference. But of course, the reaction is limited. It's not like it can run at any speed. And so if you use the battery, the voltage actually drops. And the more current you're drawing, the more the voltage drops. Now, you guys have learned about catalysts. What happens to the reaction rate when things get cold? It slows down. This guy's a real problem for Californians like me. One year when I was at PC, we went on a ski trip, and we get up one morning, and two people's cars just wouldn't start. Their batteries were dead, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, like, oh, no, I have to go get a new battery. Um, one of them just got a jump start, and they're like, hey, it works fine, so I'll get a battery when I get back home. They drove back to PC. Hey, it works fine. What was the problem? The battery wasn't running optimally, so when it was cold, the reaction rate slowed down too much. I mean, it wasn't doing anything. It was just cold. You know, no turnover of any kind. The, the, the reaction basically stopped because they probably had a little bit of battery acid, you know. Um, 
But when it was warm, it still worked fine. I had that problem when I moved to Nebraska. You know, suddenly cold morning and my car won't start because my battery was kind of sketchy. As long as it was warm, it was working fine. But when it gets cold, the reaction rate drops and you have to have a battery that is better. So, yeah, some practical aspects there of the batteries. For your hypothesis today, you have to have an observation about either batteries or resistors in series or parallel. So a student asked me, I don't know where I would see these. I told the student, well, pop open the back of your calculator. See the batteries? Are those in series or in parallel? There's more than one, and I said batteries, it's actually cells, right? But there's more than one cell in there. Are they connected in series or parallel? And so you observe, in the back of my calculator, the cells appear to be connected in, appear to be connected in series. Pretty sure they're connected in series. And so then you say, why would they connect them in series? So you hypothesize, and of course you, I'm not expecting you to all use this thing, but just you know how you do it. What reason would they have, based on your understanding, to make two batteries in series, or two cells, excuse me, in series? And so you think about, well, the cell has a certain voltage, a certain energy per charge, and if I put one after the other, then the difference from the bottom to the top should, you know, and you have your hypothesis of why they would do it, and then a test, test that's going to be done using resistors, that would test your prediction, or a prediction of your hypothesis. So resistors in series, it's like that. This is called series. In series, you have a single path so that electrons that go in one side have to go through every item that's in series and come out the other side. There's no alternate paths. And when you put things in series, because there's no alternate paths, they all have the same current. But of course, the voltage across them could be different. But since they're in a row and the voltage is the energy per charge, the voltage is the sum of all of the voltages across each individual item. So in series, all of them have the same current, but the total voltage is the sum of each individual one. The voltages can be different. It depends on the resistance values. Now, if you put them in parallel, so this here is parallel, Now you see that the current can go like this, like this, like this, or like this. So it comes in here and it can go in any one of those three paths. So the current total is equal to the sum of the currents. <coughs> Whoops, two more. through each of the items. But remember voltage. What is voltage measuring? The difference between what and what? It's measuring the difference between the two sides of the resistor. So if you look at my picture in the, with them in parallel, the tops of each resistor are connected together. So those are all at the same electric potential, all the same voltage. The bottoms are all connected together. The bottoms are all at the same voltage. So that means the voltage across each resistor in parallel is the same. So you have 
Voltages are the same when they're in parallel. Currents can be different. And the total current is the sum of all of them because current is the charge flowing through. If they're in series, the current has to be the same for all of them, has the same charge flowing through all of them, but the voltages can be different. So the question is, how do you treat resistors that are in series or parallel? <clears throat> By the way, this reminds me, I did not remember to create, remember school got out early yesterday. I still stayed in work till past four, but I did not get a homework assignment created for you. And I'm not going to make one now just because you don't have the normal time for doing the homework. Um, so just so you have that and don't worry about it or wonder what's going on. So resistors in series, resistors in parallel. This picture, and I've got to erase stuff I wrote. This picture is showing us how we find the equivalent to three resistors all. How are the resistors arranged in that picture? Series or parallel? In the picture below, it said, or right above the picture, it says same current. Is that series or parallel for that picture? Series. How do you make that identification? That's the more important part. How do you make it? Because they're all in line, because it's end to end. Very good answers. So those are series. So they all have the same current. An equivalent resistor is a resistor that the circuit can't tell is any different from the combination. So that means the current flowing through the resistor has to be the same, and the total voltage drop has to be the same. So I have two diagrams here that if they are equivalent, the current total here is the same as the current total here. And the voltage is the same as the voltage. And so I look at these and I apply Ohm's law. And so this one here, if the resistors are in series, how do the voltages relate? You add them. So the voltage total is voltage 1 plus voltage 2 plus voltage 3. Now using Ohm's law, that's IR1 plus IR2 plus IR3. Why did I have the same I for all of them? Same current when they're in series. So I can simplify this to equals I times R1 plus R2 plus R3. Now, if we look at the second circuit here, it's going to have voltage total is equal to I times RS. So I have two equations for voltage total. One says it's equal to IRS. The other says it's equal to I times R1 plus R2 plus R3. Well, now we just use our real genius maneuvers, divide both sides by I, and we have the series resistance. If I have resistors that are in series, I can replace them with one resistor that's equal to the sum of each one. So if I have resistances of 1, 2, and 3 in series, I can replace it with one resistor that has a value of 1 plus 2 plus 3 equals 6 ohms resistance. So that's how resistors add in series. Now I'm going to repeat for parallel. I don't think I have a picture for parallel. No. So I'm going to repeat for parallel. So I'm going to draw a battery Nope, that would be serious. So here's my circuit. Which side of my battery is positive? 
top or bottom? <laughs> the positive side is, yes, the top because it's the long one. So here's the positive side. Does current flow, this charge naturally, charge being positive charge, naturally flow into positive or away from positive? Positive charge should flow away from positive. Even though it's electrons in the circuit, we draw the current as positive charge motion. So the current is going like this. Now what happens to that current when it gets here? Some of it goes here, some of it goes here, and some of it goes here. That's right, Corso. So I1, I2, I3. We can look at this and we can just take what I've written in red and say, well, the current must be equal to current 1 plus current 2 plus current 3. Because we can't create or destroy the current, it has to just keep flowing. So there's a relationship between the currents. Well, now I'm going to use Ohm's law again. I is V over R. Why did I use the same V for all of them? In parallel, the voltage has to be the same. Well, now let's go back to our equivalent circuit is going to be the same thing. So it's going to have the V is equal to I R parallel now. I'll redraw the equivalent circuit just so we. So on this one, we're going to have. I is equal to V over R parallel. Well, setting these I's equal to each other gives me V over R parallel is equal to V over R1 plus V over R2 plus V over R3. And once again, it doesn't take any kind of mathematical genius to cancel out all the V's and get 1 over RP is equal to 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. So that's how resistors in parallel add. So if I had R1 equals 1, R2 equals 2, and R3 equals 3 ohms, then what would the parallel resistance be? Okay, he may just be quicker than me because I don't know. There I've done my substitution. Now I would need to find a common denominator, which is, of course, going to be 6. And so this would be 6 over 6 and 3 over 6 and 2 over 6. So 6 plus 3 plus 2 is 11. So 1 over RP is 11 over 6 ohms. So RP is 6 ohms over 11, which is that what you said? Corso? Yeah. yeah, nice job. Now, Things to notice, when you add resistors in parallel, did the resistance go up or down? Went down. 6 over 11 is less than 1. 1 was the smallest resistance I started with. Whenever you put resistors in parallel, you end up with an equivalent resistance that's lower than the lowest one you started with. When we added them in series, the series was just adding them algebraically, so if you add them in series, does resistance go up or down? Up. It's always bigger than the highest one. So if you have two resistors, 
If you put them in parallel, you get a lower resistance than the lowest one. If you put them in series, you'll get a higher resistance than the highest one. So you've got options, depending on which way you want to go. Okay, the, uh, the last, I think this is the last slide. There, okay, there's one more. Yeah, that's just more complicated. Something that we will be doing in our next homework assignment that will be the one due Friday is combining resistors. And in combining resistors, you need to find, okay, what's in series, what's in parallel, do the combining and then look at it again. So this here is a complicated circuit and you identify, wait, these two are in parallel with each other. Likewise, these three are in parallel with each other. So you have to find the parallel combination for these three, the parallel combination for these two. When you do that, you now have these two parallel combinations you found are in series with each other. So you add them in series. And then you have these resistors have top and bottom connected. You add those in parallel. And then you have two in series to get to the end. Complicated process, right? But it gets there. So you're going to do one or two of these to get the experience of identifying why didn't we take these three and say these three were all in parallel? Why didn't we say those three are all in parallel? This one here is not connected to the other two there. There's the battery between them. To be in parallel, they have to have the tops connected and the bottoms connected. So even though the tops are all connected, only these two had the bottoms connected. So, you know, same kind of thing here. Why are these not in series? Because there is another pathway. It, it, things that go through this don't have to go through that. So, so if there was another wire wire between the bottom point of RS and the upper point of R1, that? Between here and here? Or just maybe the, the one to the left of R1? How could you? Well, I, I'm just I'm I'm not sure where you're saying to put it. I can't answer until I figure that out. For R one to be in parallel in in the middle picture in this picture here, to make this in parallel, you'd have to have a wire across here, which then would be what we call shorting the battery. It shorted the battery because it created a direct path. We call that a short circuit around it and so the battery wouldn't be doing anything but sending charge through that wire the rest of them would be ignored okay so the next slide is just a an actual numerical example oh i forgot i'm doing electrical safety um well we don't want anyone dying right right okay um i won't do this problem today i will do it in class tomorrow Electrical safety. First of all, getting shocked is not fun for most of us. I guess there's this commercial now that says some people enjoy painful things, so maybe getting shocked will make their commercial. I don't like any shocks. I did it with the Van de Graaff generator. I wasn't worried about damaging myself because it was a low current situation. Somebody mentioned that in class. Somebody already knew that. Current is the thing that we worry about with electricity. But because of Ohm's law, voltage relates to current. So first things first, don't ever grab a wire like that. Why not? If you think it might have electricity, you don't grab it like that. You want to know why? If you get shocked, and the current is large enough, that current will activate the muscles. Just like when you're putting current across the heart, makes the heart seize up, goes, Ugh. well, that's what would happen if you're getting shocked there, your hand goes, Ugh. and it'll grab, and you can't let go. And if you can't let go, you're gonna to continue to get shocked, and potentially, if that current is coming across your chest, then your intercostals lock up, you go, can't breathe, right? And that's a, probably a not pleasant way to go. So if you 
if for some reason you just have to know, is that wire hot or not, you, you do something like use the back of your hand. So if it is electrified and it causes your muscles to spasm, all you do is slap yourself in the face because you're an idiot for touching it in the first place. Right? Slap yourself in the face better than dying. So, so that's just a basic rule. You know, don't be dumb. Um, electricity going through the body has some issues. First of all, this is showing frequency. This here is going toward DC. It's still at 10 hertz here. 10 hertz isn't direct current. You see the most, <laughs> the most dangerous frequency you can have is 100 hertz. What do we use? 60 hertz because it's close to the most dangerous frequency you can have. Good to know, huh? It's, I don't know. I'm not sure why they choose a frequency that's pretty close to the most dangerous you can have. So that threshold of sensation is where you can tell you're getting shocked. Anything below that, you can't even tell. So lower than about one milliamp, you cannot tell there's electricity going through. You don't feel any sensation. And as you can see, changing frequency makes a difference. You get up to about 15 milliamps of the 60 hertz that comes out of this, and you won't be able to let go. It'll make your muscles contract. And that's when you start running into danger. Now, if you get the current across the heart, up to somewhere in the ballpark of 50 to 60 milliamps, that's gonna cause the heart to do crazy things. And when the heart's doing crazy things, what it's not doing is pumping blood. And so that would kill you. So you see that 0.1 to 0.2, it has marked as death, the death zone. If you have between 100 and 200 milliamps going across your heart, you're gonna die, right? <laughs> If it's momentary, maybe your heart will restart. But if it's continuous, you're going to die. Believe it or not, you go up above 0.2 amps, and it starts to become safer. It starts to become safer because it doesn't make your heart go into crazy rhythms. It just freezes it. And when you take away the shock, it might start right. But you go into crazy rhythms there in that, that death zone. And some of it is malfunctioning. Some of it's not. So there's really three ways you can die. Um, number one is the suffocation. If you have a current that's large enough to make the chest muscles contract and not allow you to breathe. What was that? I, okay. Number two is if you get a high enough current across the heart to make the heart go into fibrillations. Number three, I like to call the, Farmer John's ballpark Frank's effect. I don't know. You guys probably aren't from California, but Farmer John's ballpark Frank's plump when you cook them. If you put enough current through, you will cook something, and that will also kill you. One of my mom's college friends, her son was out changing sprinkler pipe, and he had a gopher in it, so he went like this to get the gopher out. And he hit a high power line with the end of the sprinkler pipe. And I, of course, did not see him after this, but they said that you could see the burn marks in his hands where the current went into his hands. You could see the burn marks on his feet where the current came out of his feet going into the ground. And it, it you know, so that's, that's the third way. That's, of course, any way you die is brutal. I don't like death. Just one last thing on the safety. Your skin is the primary resistor in your body. Once you get through the skin, the resistance is very, very small. But the skin, if you have dry skin, which is what we should all have today because it's dry, right? It's about 500 kilo ohms of resistance. So let's just calculate real quickly. If I were to stick my fingers in this socket, I wouldn't, right? But if I were to, I would have 120 volts AC. R is equal to 500 kilo ohms. What is the current?
120 over 500 would be 2.4, or not 2.4, 0 0.24, 0 0.24 milliampers. Is 0.24 milliamps going to do something to me? Am I going to feel it? We're on the 60 hertz, so we're right here. Am I going to feel 0 0.24 milliamps? Or, yeah. I did that right, didn't I? Yeah, I think I did. Where's 0.24 in this graph, everyone? Point two four is down here. It seems like seems like it should have been more effect than that, but it's down there. I shouldn't feel it at all. That doesn't make sense. I did I do my math right, everyone? 120, double it, 240 over a thousand is point two four. And it's milliamps because I'm dividing by kilo ohms. Okay. What if my skin is wet? If my skin is wet, 120 volts divided by one, that's going to be 120 milliamps. Where am I now? Yeah, I'm up here. I'm in the, the death zone. So how wet or dry your skin is makes an enormous difference on the safety. That's why the whole thing about toaster in the bathtub, right? The wet skin makes you much more susceptible. The dry skin, yeah, I mean, I can't believe I wouldn't feel it at all. It seems like that has to be wrong, but you know, it, the, the numbers work out. Body resistance is about half a kilo ohms, half a kilo ohm. Now I swear in Rambo, you guys seen the, the original Rambo? No? Came out when I was in college, it's a new movie. Well, I swear in Rambo, they torture somebody with a car battery. What's the voltage of a car battery? 12 volts. Depends on the car battery, but 12 volts is a rough number. 12 volts, if you have dry skin, 500 kilo ohms, 12 volts across 500 kilo ohms is going to be what? 0 0.024 milliamps? You don't feel that. You can grab the two posts of the battery all you want. Not going to do anything. What if your skin is wet? If your skin is wet, one kilo ohm resistance, 12 volts divided by one kilo ohm is 12 milliamps. You can feel 12 milliamps? Yeah, 12 milliamps will be enough that your muscles might start spasming. Well, if you're going to torture somebody, you probably want a little more than might start spasming. I mean, I used to go to the chiropractor and use a little TENS machine. They'd crank that thing up until my back's going like this, you know? It's not torture. Well, if you're going to torture them, okay, has no one seen Rambo? Well, what they do is they, they flay his skin a little with a whip, you know? Get him cut down a little. Then they splash water on him. And so now you've cut through the skin completely. And now you're making contact with inside the skin. That cuts the resistance in half again. So now you have a lower resistance. And you can cause some pretty good torture with a car battery. Good to know, right? Yeah. Don't do any of these bad things I ever talk about, OK? True story. About five years ago, a guy in the apartments just across the street from us here, you know, the little apartment complex across 48. He thought his girlfriend was stepping out on, so he waterboarded her. Yeah. I mean, he saw it on the news. Waterboarded her? Where? Yeah. It's, it's bad, bad, bad to do things like this. Don't get ideas that you might, you know, go shock somebody.
By the way, I said you can grab both posts of your car battery all day long without a problem. I have also done this, taken a metal um, clothes hanger and gone from one side of a battery to the other. What happens then? Can't believe none of you've done that. You have a homemade welder. You you will melt <laughs> the, the clothes hanger because it has very low resistance, hence very high current going through it. And yeah, it, it works. Okay, I do have one more um, slide after this, and then we're done. Your electrical outlets. You probably have seen these. You probably don't look at them like me and say it's somebody screaming. That's what I see when I look at the outlet. So <laughs> you've got that. That is the ground. Back in the day, oh, like my grandma's house, they had one wire electricity. You're like, one wire. How many wires is it going to take? I mean, you have to have a complete circuit, so it has to go. Battery has how many poles? Twos, right? Positive one, the negative one. How's one wire going to work? Oh, that's not a problem. You just connect one side of your power to the earth, and then you have copper pipes carrying water everywhere. And you just, for an outlet, you go from the copper water pipe to one side, and then you have the one wire from the hot to the other. And it makes a complete circuit. You know it works. Problem is it's potentially dangerous because you know you're taking a shower and you know somebody shorts something and there's less resistance through you than through another pathway and, and you go zap zap. So so that's considered bad form. <laughs> so they went to two wire systems. So the two eyes there, notice one's longer, one's shorter. Those are for the two wires, the positive and the negative. So if I back out, you can see the little prong is the hot one. This one here is the one that's danger, danger, Will Robinson. Okay, Got to get the action in there. That's the hot wire. The other one is connected to ground. So instead of using the house's plumbing system, you have the ground there that's separate from the plumbing system. Smart, right? But you could still have... Okay, I say the toaster all the time, but toasters always only have two prongs. Um, let's suppose that you have a vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaners hog up power. And let's say that something goes wrong in the back vacuum cleaner, and your hot wire touches the chassis of the vacuum cleaner that's metal that your hand is grabbing. Well, then you just got current going to your hand, and nobody likes that. Agreed? So the way we have our circuits now, the mouth is a second ground. So you have two separate grounds. The one that's the mouth is called ground. The other one, the long one, is called the neutral. They're both connected to ground, but they're connected to ground separately. And so your electric circuit goes between the two vertical lines, and then the mouth goes to stuff that you might be touching to protect you in case there's some kind of circuit fault. So it's really, really not smart to break off the ground pins so that you can put your three-prong plug into a two-prong outlet. I was doing some rewiring at a house that used to be my wife's grandmother's, and I was very sad to see that they only had the two wires coming. And I saw somebody had just taken and run a wire between the neutral and the ground. Well, that's not really protecting you. So you're not supposed to do that because people assume that if you've got that ground, that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. So just some knowledge about the safety of this. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go any more on that. Final thing, fuses and circuit breakers. The purpose of a fuse, the purpose of a circuit breaker is the same thing. It's to protect our houses from drawing too much current and starting fires, right? You have wires and the wires get hot. And when the wires get hot, they can start fires. Yes, my grandmother's house, they had to completely rewire it after it caught fire and partially burned down because of the electrical wires. Um, 
Those wires over time, the insulation will get brittle, it'll wear away, they get hot, they'll make the wood next to them hot, they'll char the wood, they'll start the wood on fire. And so to keep from having the wires get too hot, we put in wires that say have a maximum current of 15 amps. That's the standard for a house. And then you have circuit breakers, such as right here. And each one of these is labeled. So like this is a 10 amp circuit breaker. If there's more than 10 amps going to, to the outlet that says outlet one, this one here is going to detect too much current and it uses a relay to open the circuit to break it so you don't have electrical contact and then you don't have electricity flowing there anymore. So the, the idea here is to keep from having too much current flowing through the wires. So that's why we have circuit breakers. Fuses were the same idea, but a fuse is not reusable. The circuit breaker is spring loaded, you reset it and you're good to go again. What you don't do is you don't physically make it so it can't, um, can't break. Because if you do that, then you're just bypassing it. Fuses, you have a piece of metal, and if enough current goes through it, the metal melts. So a fuse, it melts if it gets too much current. Because it melts, you break the connection. No more circuit, no more danger, but then you have to put a new fuse in. Worst idea in the world is this fuse keeps burning. I'm going to put in something else that won't burn. I heard a great uh, Darwin Award story about some dude whose pickup kept blowing fuses. And he realized these 22 shells are the perfect size to fit in my fuse box. So he put a 22 shell in there. And so, of course, has a lot of current going through it, gets hot. The powder in there ignites and it fires <laughs> it's 22 shell hits it and kills him okay not funny when a person dies but not smart maneuver don't try to defeat these things they're there for protection one final kind i don't have anyone on here but in your bathroom you should have things that say something like gfci ground fault circuit interrupter those are a slightly different beast. Those are for, to protect you. The circuit breakers and fuses are to protect the wiring. Those protect you. What those do is they measure the net current because you have current flowing out and current flowing in. And how should those two relate? They should be the same unless you have something that's gone wrong. And so it measures the difference in those two and if those are different, then it says, uh-oh, you have current going through something else that's bad and breaks the contact. And so those GFCIs, you have to have them in the bathroom because that's where the whole toaster in the bathtub thing can occur. And so anywhere where there's moisture, they have these kinds of things to protect people in case electricity is going through them. Okay, let's take a break until...